vengeance! We are armed! What would you do if you knew all the you things we know? We would you stand up for truth? Or would you turn away to? And then what if you saw all of the things that's wrong? Would you stand tall and strong? Or would you turn and walk away? What would you do if you knew all the things we know? Would you stand up for truth? Or would you turn away too? And then what if you saw all of the things that's wrong? Would you stand tall and strong? Or would you turn it all I see a message from the government. Like every day, I'll watch it and listen. And Our speaker, Anna Balzer, is a Jewish American. She's a graduate from Columbia. She's a Fulbright scholar and a three-time volunteer with the International Women's Peace Service. And that's a human rights organization based in the occupied Palestinian territories. And since the summer of 2005, she has been touring around the United uh, States and abroad with a presentation and a book, and she has some of her things out there, describing her personal experience, her observations, and her photographs from her eight months documenting human rights violations in the West Bank. <coughs> and she's been supporting Palestinian and Israeli nonviolent resistance against the occupation. Anna's presentation is called Life in Occupied Palestine, Eyewitness Stories and Photos, and her book is entitled Witness in Palestine, A Jewish American Woman in the Occupied Territories. And the purpose of her presentation and her book is to provide those interested in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with critical information and documentation that would be difficult for us to obtain from the mainstream U.S. media, and to encourage dialogue toward taking action on the issue, and that's what those little cards are about. Anna's hope is that her presentation and her book will offer a thoughtful perspective. She is the granddaughter of Polish-born Holocaust refugees. She sees it as her responsibility to expose the injustices of today in light of those of the past. So let us give Anna a gracious welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and for welcoming me. I spoke here in this area about three years ago in the spring of 2006 and I had a great time and wondered when I would be able to come back. I'm, this is just, I guess, the last day of about a week-long tour through Wisconsin. My assistant and I both feel like Wisconsin is just one of the best states to tour and there's so many people here who care so much about these issues and who want to take part in positive change. So um, I, uh, I'm glad to be able to spend my last evening in Wisconsin here with everyone, uh, everyone here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. At least um, it's, it's hard for me to yell too much because I give so many talks, but if anyone can't hear comfortably, please do tell me because that's what I'm here to do is help you um, hear what I uh, have seen and have to say. Um, I wanted to introduce myself a little more and just clarify that I am a Jewish American and that I got into this work when I was teaching English in Turkey. I started traveling through the Middle East during my vacation. So I backpacked around Iran and Syria and Lebanon and along my way I was taken in by families of Palestinian refugees. And uh, at the time, I didn't know who the Palestinians were. I didn't know where Palestine was. I didn't know there was a Palestine. I really just had no idea about this Palestinian uh, narrative and history. And through my friendships with the people that I met, I started to hear for the first time in my life a completely different version of the history and present of the area from anything I had ever heard or learned growing up as a Jewish American. And my first uh, reaction, <laughs> was complete shock and disbelief. I thought, no way, no way is this true. This is totally different from what I heard. This is propaganda, what these people are telling me about 1948, etc. And uh, I set out maybe to affirm that I 
really knew what I was talking about, and as soon as I began to do some research, I realized how much about this issue we do not hear about here in this country. And not really knowing who to believe anymore, I decided to go to Palestine to see with my own eyes uh, what was happening, and that's what I'm here to tell you about tonight. Um, before I do so, I wanted to clarify a few different categories. Let's see, do we have a couple chairs free still here? Are those free? Do we have one here? Okay, well, I think Great. one of those is for Sister Ruth. She, okay. She, 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 no, she, 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 um, maybe even two people could move there because there's going to be probably more latecomers and these are the precious chairs we want to have then. So thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Be careful of the wires. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an obstacle. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Watch thank out you. for the wires. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well done. <Matt. laughs> well um, so anyway, that's what I want to tell you about. I wanted to clarify some categories that can be rather confusing about this issue. I wanted to, to distinguish between what it means to be Jewish. So I am Jewish, but what does that mean? Somebody who's Jewish is somebody either of the Jewish religion or the Jewish lineage. It's a bloodline. My mom's Jewish, her mom's Jewish, etc. And that, to be Jewish, is different from what it means to be Israeli. And Israeli is a citizen of the state of Israel as a citizenship. And that, to be Israeli, is different from what it means to be a Zionist. Zionism is the political ideology behind, uh, basically, uh, the existence and preservation of a Jewish state in historic Palestine at any cost, essentially, unconditionally. Um, anyway, these are separate categories, and they can be very confusing. Um, and sometimes they overlap in the same person, but they aren't the same thing. There are Jews who are not Israeli, like myself. I don't have Israeli citizenship but I'm still Jewish. There are Israelis who aren't Jewish. About 20% of the people who do have Israeli citizenship are Palestinian. There are Jews who are anti-Zionist, who say this land should be for anybody who's been living there for generations. It doesn't matter what their religion is or their ethnicity. And then there are Zionists who aren't Jewish. The increasingly influential Christian Zionist movement, largely based in this country, that talks about really fueling this conflict to bring about Armageddon, to speed the return of the Messiah. Uh, not at all pro-Jewish, right? You know, what happens to Jews in the Armageddon? It's not about preserving Judaism, but it is Zionism. So we see, again, this, 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 these different categories, and we have to be really uh, diligent about distinguishing, distinguishing these things. The danger being, um, you know, we, we cannot associate the things that Israel is doing, and the things I found, occupation, oppression, oppression very sobering. Uh, these things, occupation and oppression, have nothing to do with Judaism, and they shouldn't be associated with Judaism, because what Israel is doing is fundamentally opposed to Judaism and the basic tenets of all the major religions. And likewise, to speak out when we see violations of human rights, oppression of any group by any group, um, to speak out against this is not anti-Semitic. It's not anti-Judaism. Um, in fact, it's in, in line with the tradition of social justice in Judaism and other communities um, through history. So I just wanted to say that especially for those people who aren't Jewish but who have worked on this issue, I know the names that you are called and it's completely, um, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you, it is not anti-Semitic to speak out when anybody's rights are being violated. With that, I'd like to start the photo presentation. Could you hit the lights there? So just to orient you, of course, Israel, Palestine are located here in the Middle East, and here's a larger version of that map. And the blue areas, oh, first of all, the entire area here is historic Palestine a historic region of the area. Inside it, we have the blue areas, which are uh, present day, the state of Israel. In the, and then we have the beige areas on the left and right, which are re what remain of the Palestinian official territories. And on the left, we have the Gaza Strip, and on the right, we have the West Bank. Now, in 1967, Israel occupied these remaining Palestinian lands. Um, and so these areas are now the 1967 occupied Palestinian territories. They remain under occupation and have for the past 42 years. And we hear about the occupation, um, but we don't necessarily know what that means, right? What does it mean to occupy an area? What does it mean that the US is occupying Iraq? Uh, what would it feel like if 
Racine, Wisconsin were under a foreign military occupation. What, what does that mean? What would it be like? So I want to kind of clarify what, what this occupation is about. So in the occupied Palestinian territories, there are both Palestinians and Israelis who are living there, but they use different roads. There are Palestinian roads, there are Israeli roads. <coughs> the Palestinian roads tend to be older, sometimes even unusable, like this one. <coughs> Meanwhile, the Israeli roads tend to be more modern, constructed by the Israeli government for Israeli citizens who are living in the area. And the Israeli citizens living in the area are Jewish citizens of Israel, and they're settlers. The Palestinians living in the area are, are, for the most part, Muslim or Christian. Actually, there's a lot of Palestinian Christians, right, historically about 25% not too long ago. Um, anyway, so what this amounts to is one kind of road for Jewish people and one kind of road if you're Christian or if you're Muslim. Um, the exception is if a Palestinian can get a permit, maybe, in which case they might be able to use a certain part of a certain road, but in all other cases the roads are segregated. Uh, they also have different colored license plates. Palestinian cars have green or white plates. Israeli cars have yellow plates. So you can see from far away which kind of person is using which kind of road. Here, for example, you have a road with two lanes. On the left is the lane for Israelis. On the right is the lane for Palestinians, all of whom have to pull over at the side of the road at what's called the checkpoint, where they're going to go through a kind of screening process, a check, um, to, to pass through. And checkpoints are perhaps similar to what uh, many people might have experienced at like a border crossing and that you have to stop and answer some questions. You're passing, you know, you might be passing from one country to another if you went up to Canada. Um, one of the big differences though with checkpoints in this part of the world, as you can see from this map of the permanent checkpoints that have been installed in the West Bank, oh, yeah. <laughs> these blue things here, is that the vast majority of these checkpoints are not located around that border between the Palestinian West Bank and present-day Israel, but actually located internally within the Palestinian territories. So most of them are between Palestinian <coughs> towns and villages. And what that means for a Palestinian person who, let's say, they're living up just north of Hebron and want to travel up to the city of Bethlehem, it's about 15 miles. I understand that's about the distance between here and Kenosha, mm -hmm. more or less. All right, so how long does it take to drive from Racine to Kenosha? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. So, well, for a Palestinian person to drive that same distance between here and Kenosha, it's going to take a minimum maybe two hours, two and a half hours, probably though more like four, six, maybe even eight hours, because of the number of times that they're going to have to stop along the way at these checkpoints. So obviously it's, it's pretty frustrating to have to spend all this time waiting, but one of the biggest issues is just daily life, you know? Uh, you can't hold a steady job. You don't know if it's going to take you 10 minutes or 5 hours to get to work. You can't guarantee you can come home to your kids in the uh, evening. Students have a problem too, unless you happen to have a university in your little village. Higher education is out of the question. You can't consistently get to your classes, nor can your teachers get to their classes if they're Christian or Muslim. So it's not just a question of waiting, but the breakdown of every aspect of, of daily life, including the ability to earn a living and to get an education. Um, imagine if, I don't know, coming here tonight, um, you, uh, let's take a better example, maybe something in the morning, uh, let's say services where you might go to church, for example, if they started at 9 o'clock, um, maybe you have to leave your house um, at 8.30. Well, imagine if instead you had to get up along the lines of, I don't know, 3.30 in the morning and go outside waiting, shivering in the cold every half mile or so, waiting to show your ID while people of a different religion or ethnicity from you were whizzing by. How would that affect your spiritual life, your education, your work life, your social life, your family life? You know, everything is affected. Health is one of the biggest issues. People are stopped in their ambulances on the way to hospitals, not allowed to pass. I've documented story after story of women going into labor at checkpoints, losing their children. My friend's six-month-old son died in his arms waiting in their car to cross a, a checkpoint to get to the hospital. These things are, are happening constantly because people can't move around. Um, but mobility is only one of the major issues. Another one is settlements, which are basically communities of Jewish Israelis that have been uh, built on these occupied Palestinian lands. So here, for example, you have Palestinian land in the West Bank, owned by Palestinian farmers near 
near Bethlehem in East Jerusalem. And yet you have the city that's been built right on top of it that is exclusively for Jewish Israelis. So have we seen this kind of a process before? Of a, of a country going into another area, foreign area, and pushing off the indigenous population, and then building towns and cities for its own population. We did that. Of course, of course, this is a this is something that's happened all over the world through history. There's a word for it. It's colonization. And a lot of these settlements in other languages they're called colonies. That's essentially what they are. Um, they are populated. Uh, in part by people moving there because they believe God promised them the land. But most of the settlers are moving there for a different reason. Why are they moving there? Um, you know, they'd probably rather live in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. What makes the average Israeli go violate international law to go live on some the so-called enemy's land? Do they think it's theirs? Well, there's a minority, I said, but the majority, it's a different reason. Mm -hmm. Are they given something by the Israeli army? Absolutely. They're given by the Israeli government. The Israeli government actually pays its own citizens to move from Israel onto these occupied areas with enormous financial subsidies, either financial packages, they'll subsidize their mortgages, they'll subsidize their transportation, um, they'll offer essentially a much higher standard of living if a family is willing to uproot itself and go live on these other people's territory. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when Israel talks about the impossibility of ever make, making settlers lead, let's remember four out of five of the settlers who are moving to these areas are moving because they are being paid by their government to be there. Um, and uh, when I say that, that Israelis are being paid by their government to go onto somebody else's land, who's really paying those people to move onto Palestinian land? We are. We are. The United States. Good. You guys, you guys know what you're talking about. That's right. Um, all of us are. Anyone who's paying taxes um, here in the United States, we are a part of this. Um, the U.S. government gives Israel what amounts to more than $10 million every day in violation of our own U.S. laws, in violation of international law. Israel is actually violating more U.N. resolutions than any other country in the history of the United Nations ever has. More than Iraq, more than Iran, more than them put together. So when we're talking about the violations of, of Middle Eastern countries, of, of international law, and Israel isn't mentioned, <laughs> Um, it's, it's pretty hypocritical, it's pretty ironic, especially given the fact that we are the ones funding their constant violation of international law. Um, and we're not talking about a poor, you know, impoverished country that desperately needs arms. We're talking about an industrial uh, superpower, a military superpower, has one of the strongest militaries in the world, by far the strongest in that area. Um, we're talking about a place that we give more than all of we give to Sub-Saharan Africa combined. <laughs> um, you know, so it's a huge amount of money, and it might feel as if it's on the other side of the world, but we are very much involved. We're the ones paying for it. So to not, to not know about what's happening or to not do anything is to be complicit as our government is doing something, to be one of the people who, who knew but didn't say anything when their government was doing something negative. So there's not really, you know, the people you might meet who don't want to get involved in this issue too bad. People are already involved. We don't have that choice anymore. Either we're involved in a negative way or we're involved in more positive change. And, and thanks to our incredible generosity, there are now settlements all over the West Bank. These red dots show you where you have basically a Jewish-only colony that's been built on Palestinian land, along um, with them, of course, the segregated roads. And some of the settlers, as, as it was mentioned, some of the settlers are moving not only because of money, but for a bigger ideological reason. They believe that this land belongs to Jewish people, that Christians and Muslims have no right to be there. And they can be extremely violent and ideological, coming into the area to actually push off the Christian and Muslim population, um, armed to the teeth oftentimes with U.S. Uh, you know, American weapons, um, and th these people are very violent, um, terrorizing the population. The Palestinians, the Christians and Muslims in the area are not allowed to have any kinds of weapons. Um, rarely they will manage to get some, but it's, uh, it's actually quite rare. The majority of the Palestinian population has nothing to defend itself with. Uh, they have stones, they have their bodies, basically. So that's the power dynamic that is immediately evident when you get to the area. Very different from what we might hear in the news here when all we hear about are Palestinians with weapons and not about uh, Israeli terrorism. 
Um, there wasn't, a lot of people when I show them this, they say, well, weren't these settlers removed? Because there were settlers removed at some point from somewhere. So where was that? Well, that was actually um, from Gaza, the Gaza Strip, the other area under occupation. And it's true that Israel withdrew its settlers from Gaza in August of 2005. Um, 8,000 settlers were evicted from Gaza Strip and immediately replaced by 12,000 settlers in the West Bank. <laughs> so at no point did the settler population go down. It continued to rise. And at the same time, Gaza was never actually liberated. In fact, Gaza will legally remain occupied territory as long as Israel controls the borders, the airspace, the shores. Israel has complete control over the Gaza Strip. In fact, removing its own population allowed it to seal it off, preventing food, medical supplies, and people from getting in or out. People are essentially living in an open-air prison, oftentimes wasting away, unable to get even the most basic materials to sustain themselves. Um, so the idea that somehow Palestinians were given a great chance at liberation, and then they just blew it because they're all a bunch of you know, terrorists. These things do not hold up to scrutiny. Um, what we see is that the Gazan 1.4 million people population has been consistently imprisoned and starved, men, women, and children. And yes, some have responded to incredible violence with, with violence. Um, and, we can, and, and everyone should be held accountable for the violence they use, but, it's, but all we hear about is, is theirs without the bigger context around it. And a good example of a time when we might not have heard the full story was this past winter during the attacks on Gaza in which Israel essentially um, constantly bombed and eventually outright invaded the Gaza Strip. So if you can imagine you're in an, an enclosed area, you have nowhere else to go, and then you are being bombed from above. It's like bombing a prison, basically. Um, and uh, people went to UN shelters to hide. They were bombed there. They were bombed in hospitals, bombed in their schools. Um, police stations were bombed. So everything was, was so much of Gaza was obliterated. Um, during that time, there was a death toll. There were rocket attacks on Israeli citizens. Uh, in that time, uh, 1,400 Palestinians, uh, mostly civilians, were killed. And 13 Israelis, about half of them civilians, were killed. Of course, you, I mean, I cannot imagine the, uh, the pain that was for those 13 Israelis' families uh, losing a person in their family. <coughs> we should not diminish that. But what about the 1,400 Palestinians killed with our tax dollars? Um, and, and that weren't, you know, told by name, that weren't described, that weren't given to us necessarily in our newspapers. This is really dangerous that we're not getting the full story. And I think one of the reasons we're not getting the full story has to do with our media, as I just alluded to. This is just an anecdote. A friend of mine was flying back from Palestine to the US, where she picked up this issue of International Newsweek because it had a very sympathetic article about the plight of the Palestinians at the top there. So she bought it to read it on the plane. Um, and then she had a layover, another layover, this time right near here in Chicago, where she found this. <laughs> So it's also Newsweek, August 2004, but the U.S. version, with almost the same information, uh, but one big difference for us, the article about the plight of the Palestinians had been completely removed from the entire magazine. And not just from the uh, cover issue, not just from the cover, it was omitted from the U.S. version of Newsweek. And this is one example. Uh, it's not the only example, if it were, it wouldn't be such a big deal, but what we find is that when we compare our media with the media virtually everywhere else in the world, mm -hmm. is that this is a pattern. You know, you, you don't have to take my word for it. I probably wouldn't. I didn't take people's word for it. You know, do your own research. Go out there. Find out. Um, you can go almost anywhere in the world and get this information, you know. Uh, Israelis got this, right? Everyone got this and we got this. You can go to Israeli mainstream media sources and get much more information than you're getting here in the U.S. You can go to European, Asian, African, Latin American mainstream media sources, U.S. alternative media sources. You can go to legitimate, make sure they're credible, internet sources. It's become very easy. I don't know if democracy now is, um, is is on the radio or on TV around here. Let me know if you know the time and date. But, um, uh, but anyway, there are ways of getting this information uh, today, and there's no reason to take my word for it. 
you're absolutely um, encouraged to go out and do that research. Um, there are handouts for those of you here today um, with the facts and statistics from this talk as well as the sources of that information. Good sources also for more information. And again, look for your own, just make sure that they're credible. But you're going to have to go beyond US mainstream media sources because you're not going to get the information there. And for those of you watching on television, people can also go to my website, AnnaInTheMiddleEast.com. Um, so another thing we're not necessarily going to hear too much about in the media are the other Israelis, that there are Israelis in uh, you know, settlements and in the army, but there are also a lot of Israelis who refuse to take part in what their government is doing. The refuseniks, for example, who have spoken out, who stood up for what they believe. Uh, many of them have been thrown into jail, uh, have lost their families, have lost their jobs over this issue, but they remain strong, held to their principles. In fact, thousands of them, more and more every single day, are refusing. Um, a lot of Israelis will actually go in to work with Palestinians in the occupied territories. Um, in fact, the, the majority of the Israeli population is, that, is either very critical of or outright against the occupation. So something that might be uh, considered almost radical here in this country to talk about Israel's occupation of Palestinian lands is completely normal in Israel. Nobody would ever call it anti-Semitic. <laughs> uh, it's just completely normal in much of the world. We are just this island of ignorance here. And that's why you see you hear this stifling and this hate speech constantly about it. So anyway, a lot of Israeli activism, this is nothing new. In fact, there have been Jews and uh, Muslims and Christians coexisting relatively harmoniously in this land for a very long time. In fact, originally, before uh, the creation of Israel and Zionist immigration, um, there were different kinds of Palestinians living in the area. There were Jew Jewish Palestinians, Christian Palestinians, and Muslim Palestinians. There had been Jews as well as Christians and Muslims who were living in this area for hundreds or thousands of years before Zionist immigration began and Israel was eventually created. And they were living actually in relative harmony. In fact, Jews lived, lived better within the Arab world than they lived almost anywhere else in, in the Christian world, for example. So a lot of people think, well, you know what, if ever, there's nothing we can ever do about it because they're just kind of uh, incompatible, fundamentally. Well, it's not true because actually relatively recently, only about a hundred uh, years ago, they were living in relative harmony. But with the implementation of, of an exclusivist model, which basically excluded the indigenous population, for understandable reasons, so Jews wanted to have their own state, but what that meant was Christians and Muslims had to leave. With that, there was a lot uh, more uh, uh, conflict between them, and we've seen that continue today. Uh, here's an Israeli activist protesting the policies of her government alongside Palestinians and internationals. And this demonstration was one against the wall, which I'd like uh, to show you a picture of. This is a picture of me on the right and a friend of mine standing in front of the wall that Israel is currently building in the West Bank with our tax dollars. Uh, this is what it looks like in populated areas. It's about 25 foot concrete. Uh, in unpopulated areas, it is built at the base with a fence and which that is reinforced then with heavy duty electric sensory wire, razor wire, thermal imaging, and sniper towers. And when you look at the U.S. media, either the wall isn't mentioned or it's called a fence, which makes people think, you know, like in my backyard kind of fence, not the kind of fence that surround, the fences that surround prisons here in the United States, for example. Um, anyway, still a lot of people feel, look, you know, these people are fighting, and maybe if we can just separate them, stick a wall between them, they'll stop. You know, interesting question, right? Does separation, does segregation bring peace, first of all? And also, interestingly, you know, uh, if you want to separate Palestinians from Israelis, why would you build the wall with almost 80% of it, more than 80% of it, not even touching that border between the West Bank and present-day Israel, but weaving off and deeply into the West Bank, in effect annexing all of these blue areas here onto the Israeli side, and particularly the blue areas in the north there, which are where most of the water sources are, so that Israel controls almost all of the water, taking it 
often from under the feet of Palestinians, selling it back to them at higher prices than Jewish Israelis have to pay for it. So resources are a major issue. And then, of course, the other area where much land is being lost is in Jerusalem, a holy city for Jews as well as Christians and Muslims who have now been essentially cut off from their places of worship, from their holy sites. Um, uh, the majority of Christians and Muslims now cannot go to pray to visit Jerusalem, um, which is a historic, uh, economic, developmental, um, geographic, and religious center of their lives and their history. Um, and if you factor in not only the wall, but also the checkpoints <coughs> and settlements, the areas out of Palestinian control are now more like these blue areas, leaving the Palestinian population in these beige areas in smaller and smaller little islands. Jericho is an island. Um, let's see, Calculi as a city completely surrounded by the wall, for example. Um, and, and when we look at this, we, I think, should ask ourselves, what is going on here? You know, when I first heard about the occupation, I thought, first of all, I didn't want to believe it. And then when I understood that it was actually occurring, I thought, well, occupation is ugly. Okay, but it's for security. Israel has to secure its country. It has to secure its citizens. You know, that's its job. What's confusing to me about this argument now, having been there, is that if you want to secure your country, you would want to define your borders and secure them. But Israel, in its entire history of being a country, has never officially defined its own borders. It, its borders grow over time onto somebody else's land. Does that make Israel safer? You know, Jimmy Carter says, recognize Israel. What Israel? Which Israel? Where does it start? Where does it end? You know, if you want to protect your civilians, would you pay them sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to go live on the so-called enemy's territory? Does that make them safe? Of course not. Lots of the Israelis we hear about being killed are living very vulnerably on somebody else's land. Um, you know, if you want to separate Palestinians from Israelis, why would you build a wall between Palestinians and Palestinians? Bethlehem, for example, has been completely cut in half by the wall, leaving now tens of thousands of Palestinians on the wrong side of the wall, disconnected, cut off from their schools, their jobs, their hospitals, their livelihoods, their families, their communities, exposed to Israel, but they don't have rights there. Does that make Israel safer? You know, when we hear about security in the media, it often seems you know, intuitive. Well, if people are carrying bombs, check them, right? Little do we know that the checkpoints are between Palestinians and their hospitals or their schools. You know, if, if you want, if people are fighting, separate them. Little do we know where the wall is actually being built. A lot of this might make sense when we hear about it, but when we see the way that it's actually being implemented on the ground, it doesn't really make sense within the context of security. So if it's not about security, then what is it about? And I'd like to show you a series of four maps that I think illustrates very well what has been happening here now for a very long time. So these maps show you the uh, progression of land transfer in this area over the past 60 or so years. The green areas are Palestinian land. The white areas at the beginning are land purchased by Jewish immigrants who are coming over from Europe, either because they wished to create a Jewish state or because they had nowhere else to go. Uh, there were a lot of refugees, of course, from the Holocaust, from the Nazi Holocaust. Um, this in contrast to the Jewish Palestinians, many of whom uh, were not Zionists. They had been living there with Muslims and Christians, and they were working towards a Palestinian state, like their neighbors and friends. Um, anyway, so the Zionist uh, movement had about 8% in 1946. Then in 1947, after tremendous persecution, of course, of Jewish people in Europe. The UN proposed to give 54% of this area in the Middle East to the Jewish people so that they could create a Jewish state. Uh, these white areas in the second map there. And that left Palestinian Christians with about 46% of the land in the area. Christians and Muslims, excuse me. Um, so imagine you're a Palestinian and you are being offered about half of what was already your land. <laughs> they didn't think this was terribly generous on the part of the UN 
to offer them half of their land, basically to take away half of their land. And likewise, Zionist forces had a big problem. Yes, they were happy about partition. They had lobbied for it in the United Nations uh, successfully. It was a big gain from 8 to 54 percent. But they had a major problem. And that is that they wanted to create a Jewish state. This was their, their dream, their vision, understandably, given what they had been through. They wanted to create a Jewish state. But there were all of these non-Jews who were living there. The, the majority of the people who were living on the land where they wished to create a Jewish state simply weren't Jewish. They were Muslim and they were Christian. And you can't have a Jewish state with a non-Jewish majority. And so Zionist forces proceeded to expel the majority of the non-Jewish population from the land in what became known to uh, Israelis as the War of Independence and to Palestinians as al-Nakba, which means in Arabic, the catastrophe, in which the majority of the Christian and Muslim population were oftentimes violently expelled from their homes and lands in an effort to, in the words of Zionist leaders, cleanse the area of the, this other culture and religion in order to be able to fulfill the vision of a Jewish state. Um, the, the, the people surviving from this, um, from, from this ethnic cleansing, let's call it what it is, the people were being pushed out because of their ethnicity and their religion. This was the reason for them having to leave. Um, there were more than 500 Palestinian villages, let me go back here, more than 500 Palestinian villages within these areas. They, the Zionist forces went beyond 54% into 78%. So imagine 500 or so villages here, um, completely raised and depopulated. And those villages are still there, many of them covered up with trees today. And the, uh, the refugees of those areas, which in 1948 were about 750,000, today number uh, more than 7 million. And they're scattered around the world. We might even have any here today. No, not, not tonight. Um, they're all over, I'm sure. There are some here in Racine. Many I've met so far in Wisconsin. Many of them are in uh, Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and really all around the world. And they are not allowed to go back to their villages, their homes and their lands. I just recently went on a trip through Syria and Lebanon and uh, Jordan where I met a lot of these refugees, um, many of whom still carry around the papers um, to their homes, to their, their land, their land deeds, their land titles showing, you know, I, I never sold my land. This is my land. I own it. I was pushed off it. I have the right, and they do, according to international law, to go back to my homes, to leave, to leave these slums, to leave these refugee camps. Um, and they're not allowed to by Israel, although they are supposed to have that right. So anyway, carrying those around, proving, you know, this is not a farce. A lot of them still have the keys to their homes that they were forced out of, you know, as they were fleeing. They hurriedly locked their doors and ran away expecting they would be back, you know, to, to, to their homes in a week or two. And now, 61 years later, they have never been allowed to return. And they are not allowed to go to these homes and these lands. Um, but I can. I'm Jewish. I could get Israeli citizenship. Uh, and I could go to his land. He's a Nakba survivor. I could go to his land um, that he was born in, that he remembers, that he lived in. Um, I could go to his land, and I could buy his land, and I could uh, farm his land, and I could build a house on his land. And if his house is still there, I could live in his house on his land. He can't even visit because he's not Jewish. And you know, we hear a lot about the, the, the Jewish state's right of existence, and, and it seems very understandable, given what Jews have been through, that they would want to have a state that was their own. But what does it mean if the existence of a Jewish state requires discriminating against Christians and Muslims? Does that change anything? Does that change that right? You know, is there a right for a place that, that replaces another population, for a diaspora to come and create a new diaspora, for a people who've been religiously and culturally expelled to then expel another religion and culture from a land? Is there a right for that? Do two rights make a, do two wrongs make a right? Um, anyway, so, uh, 
So the irony that I can now go back to these lands and they who are so welcoming and hospitable to me cannot is something uh, haunting, I think, and something uh, embarrassing, I think, for, for our actions and something we should be aware of. Um, here, for example, is one of those villages um, back in the 1930s, one of that more than 500 villages. And if you go back there today, this is what you would find. It's been planted over with trees. That's the case with the majority of those villages. Um, we hear a lot about, well, if Palestinian refugees came back, then all of the inhabitants of their homes, the Israelis, they would become refugees too. We don't hear that the vast majority of the villages that were depopulated were not then re-inhabited by Israelis, but actually systematically covered up with trees. In fact, I personally grew up putting my quarters in these little tin cans. Uh, it said Jewish National Fund, plant a tree in Israel. I thought it was this great environmental thing, you know, putting my quarters in there. I didn't realize that these quarters were going towards covering up the existence of a Christian and Muslim population in the area. And although I can go to these areas, like I said, most refugees can't, there's one little loophole. There's a little loophole to this. And that is that, um, let me go back here, and that is that, uh, the Palestinians, the way that their movement is controlled, those who are in the West Bank and Gaza, the way their movement is controlled is through their ID cards, their hawiyas. And with that, the military is able to control who can go where. Now, Palestinians get their hawiyas when they're about 15 or 16 years old, which means that before they're 15 or 16, they actually have a little bit of leeway in how much they can move around, but they're not usually going to take advantage because they're 13 and they're not going through you know, military checkpoints without their parents by themselves. So a couple of my colleagues actually have started to accompany these young people on a journey that they would otherwise never be able to take as soon as they turn 16 um, to, to three places that they would otherwise never be able to go to. And those three places um, are Jerusalem, the sea, and their destroyed villages. And along the way, they're given cameras with which they can document their experiences. And I'd like to show you some of their own photographs as well as read some of their captions as they go on this journey. The first day being to Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem, a very beautiful city. I love Jerusalem, and I had a lot of fun wandering around the city. I love Jerusalem because it's a holy city, and I would love to visit it always. These are kids who will probably, even if they live 10 miles away, never be able to go to Jerusalem again because they're not Jewish. Uh, this is um, when they go to the sea. It says, when I saw the sea, I loved it because it was very beautiful. This picture is very beautiful. And um, this is one of my favorite pictures. I'm from California. You here living in Racine. You know this is not a particularly glamorous shot of, of a sea, right, of, of the water, what it reminds us of is how exciting it is to go to the sea for the first time. I mean, if you can imagine these kids, they, can wa they watch the sunset over the sea every night from their rooftops. They're 20, 15, 20 miles away from it, but they can't go to the sea, and they can't touch it, and they can't swim in it, and they can't taste it, and they can't smell it because of their religion. And the excitement of, of pulling out the nut bus, and they're, they're screaming, they run out, they run straight into the water, even if they haven't changed, or it's raining, or it's cloudy, or whatever. And how, how exciting that is for them. And they play at the beach. And then they go to their villages. This one says, in this picture you can see the old mosque of Yazur. The Zionists took over after the 1948 Nakba. The mosque was turned into a synagogue. Our ancestors used to pray there when it was a mosque. This mosque was the biggest in Yazur in 1948. After 1948, all Palestinians were forced to leave and no Palestinians were allowed to enter the city again. Um, getting to their villages is tough. You know, they're not on any uh, modern maps. There aren't any upkept roads. Uh, to, uh, to get to them, and so they're sort of comparing these old photographs with the hillsides. Once they get there, they're exploring, they're climbing trees, and climbing <coughs> caves, and maybe picking some spices. Even once they get there, they don't know where to go. They've never been there. They've dreamed of it, but they've 
they've never actually um, been to their own villages. Um, and so what they'll end up doing is they'll call their grandparents, <coughs> the grandparents who remember the village oftentimes very, very vividly, they'll call them 15, 20 miles away, and their grandparents will guide them on this journey through their own village. You know, uh, go, go down into the valley, turn right at the pomegranate tree there on your left, that's, uh, that's your uncle's house, that on the right, that's your house. You know, guiding them on this village um, from all that they remember. Here are some of the self-portraits taken by the kids. And again, when we talk about a Jewish state and the Jewish majority, um, these are the faces that are forgotten. That that Jewish majority means that the seven million, like these kids here, can never go back to their lands. Uh, this is Ta'er, who found his grandpa's orange tree. He's excited to eat his own olives. I'm uh, sorry, his own uh, oranges. I meant to say orange tree. I didn't. And then they go back. They go back to basically the prison that they are in, in their refugee camps in the West Bank. Um, and what's happening with the occupation is similar to what has happened in Safuria and and with those other villages, and that is this sort of gradual, gradual covering up of the non-Jewish population, the history, the future, in, even in, in the occupied areas, the West Bank and Gaza. And, um, and when we see this, we should again think, you know, have we seen this before? You know, can you think of another place where you could have four similar maps of the indigenous population? Of course, absolutely, uh, the most important one to us should be what's happening right here in the United States. Mm -hmm. This doesn't even begin at the, at the beginning, but rather about halfway through. But the way that indigenous populations have been squeezed onto smaller and smaller um, islands, reservations we call them. Can you think of another historic parallel? South Africa. South Africa is the big one people bring up. Um, there are also the black South African population was ghettoized into smaller and smaller ghettos. Here they were called Bandustans. In the U.S., they were they're called uh, reservations. I was uh, here. Actually, they were even called homelands. They had another nice euphemism uh, for them. Um, anyway, uh, this, uh, the same process basically. And when we look back on this, and everyone agrees that was wrong, you know. And we look back on what happened to Native Americans, and although we might not know how to reconcile our presence here with this history, we at least acknowledge what happened to them was wrong. And we probably think, well, if we'd been around we would have spoken up. This was wrong. People shouldn't be pushed off their lands. Genocide, as happened to Native Americans, we would have been the kind of people who spoke out. Well, this is happening right now. It's happening right now. It's, a, it's, four, it's four maps, but there's going to be a fifth and a sixth. And it's going to continue. We have power to affect change in this issue, and we need to do, we need to to do that, you know, um, if, if people see these things and are simply sympathetic, it doesn't it doesn't really help all that much, to be honest. I think it's appropriate to be sympathetic, um, but it's not what changes things, and it's really not what Palestinians need or, or want. They have plenty of sympathy. It's almost degrading the way everyone takes pity on them, but isn't necessarily willing to be one of those people who steps out of their comfort zone to make change. So if we are one of those people, um, who was the kind who actually spoke out. Um, what are some things that we can do to affect change on this issue, or maybe some things that people are already doing on this issue? You get speakers like Anna <laughs> <laughs> you, you can get education, you can get speakers. I know we have a, a public speaker right here. You want to introduce yourself? Well. I'm a recent friend of Anna Balser, I'm very proud to be a friend. I'm Bob Ashmore, and some of you have heard me speak in the area here. Uh, I've been a professor at Marquette University for a long time, and uh, have uh, um, been to Israel-Palestine, and in fact taught in Gaza. So, 
But she does a wonderful job, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, so, so, so just to say, you know, we, there are people here in your community who have extensive experience. I just had dinner with him, and he has more, more experiences than I could ever have, especially in the short time I've been doing this. Are there other people here who've even been to Palestine? Yeah, it's Jeffrey Lane. Yeah, so here you, have, here you have experts, and I don't know if you've already done talks, but you have people in your community who can help to educate you on this issue, and you can continue to educate yourselves through the resources I've provided and your, <laughs> your, own, um, and your own research. So yes, educational things, educating ourselves and others. And I thank the people who made this actually happen tonight. Thank them uh, gratefully. Other ideas for getting involved. And Anna, and yeah. Elaine right here was in Palestine in December. Yes. Uh, October? Uh, yeah, October, November. Oh, with the Alamars. In fact, that's a way to get involved. Yes. <laughs> Going to Palestine, if that's an option for you. I mean, did it change your life or did it change your life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it changed our lives. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an extraordinary experience. If it's a possibility for you, um, I'm sure those people who have been to Palestine would be happy to talk to you about it, what it did for them, and also ways that other people can go on your handouts. There are also ideas um, for places, but well, ways that you can actually go to Palestine, either to, to be a witness and to go and decide for yourself and see what's happening, or if you're at a point when you want to actually work in solidarity, there are solidarity groups like the one I work with, human rights groups, that you can work with as well. So, so definitely that's an, that's an option for many um, and, and one people can consider. And Elaine on Friday is going to be meeting with Congressman Sensenbrenner to talk oh, wow. about some of these issues. so is Bob Ashmore. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so there's another one, right? Contacting our, represent our representatives, absolutely. Um, how many people here have written letters to their representatives before? All right. How did you feel after that experience of writing a letter? I emailed okay. Washington. They wanted feedback of what can change. What okay. My suggestions. Okay. <laughs> and when I wrote about the situation, they wrote something back like, this isn't what they were talking about. <laughs> Has anyone else had that experience? Yes. <laughs> right? As soon as they see Israel, they think, oh, this must be someone supporting Israel, and we'll give them the form letter back that talks about how we will never abandon um, our unconditional support, blah, 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 <laughs> having nothing to do with what we wrote. I find, personally, I find writing letters very disempowering as opposed to empowering. It doesn't make me feel like I have a voice at all. And I think that what that what, what's happening there is not that there is no use in contacting our officials. After all, those who are writing to support Israel, the majority of the people they get letters from on this issue have been very influential. This is a method that can be very influential. So why aren't we having the influence that that opposition or that other side is having? And I think the answer is organization, yeah. frankly. Um, did you want to mention well, something? Yeah, that's a, I think you have to have an organization, um, get a, a delegation from various organizations, a coalition, do your homework, get together, know who's going to be the speaker, what exactly, and, and it's, especially when there's something hot in Congress, yes. when the issue of the settlements is, is on, on the front burner. And then meet. If you're lucky with your with your representative, you might get the um, the, the staff person who's responsible. But they do report. But I, I, I yeah, I feel so. Much, I do it. I do the email. Yes. But I, I don't. Not a lot of confidence. So first of all, this is great advice, by the way. If you are going in there, be prepared. There are actually toolkits for activists. One of them is, is, is listed as a link or a phone number you can call to get it sent to you, of uh, sort of a, a, to, a checklist, a to-do list before you go in and talk to a representative, as well as before you organize a demonstration, do a town hall meeting, organize an event. It's just kind of a regular toolkit. It doesn't cost anything if you get it on the online. Um, so yes, do be prepared and, and get advice if it's from the toolkit or from others on, on how to do that. Um, but still, you know, whether or not you, you write a letter efficiently, you write a letter well, or you express your opinions well to the staff person, um, doesn't necessarily mean that anything is going to come from it. And, and again, I do believe that the issue at this point is organization. I think it may have in the past been that we were too small. 
that public opinion simply did not favor Palestinian equal rights, that there were not enough people who cared about this issue to make a dent. I believe that that's changed. I believe that's changed if you actually look, hold on, if you actually look at uh, public opinion polls on, on the way that the U.S. feels about uh, Middle East foreign, U.S. foreign policy, um, if you look at the number of people working on this issue versus how big the actual APAC and, and the other parts of the Zionist lobby are, we are actually more numerous than, than they are. Um, and I believe with our resources pooled and our energies pooled, we could have a lot of money. We are just missing the organization <coughs> point. We are fragmented, we are working here and there and everywhere passionately, and we should keep doing it. But we've all got to do at least one thing in common so that our voices are resounding as one in an effective way, the way that the opposition is able to make change. And I have been looking for a kind of campaign that I think could accomplish this for a long time, and I found what I think could really work. And that's a, that's a campaign called Five for Palestine. Um, and you have cards, each of you with you, hopefully, um, that are about Five for Palestine. And basically what the, what the card um, talks about are five things that if everybody does them, could actually make a big difference. Now here's the thing. They're all very simple things. They're, they're intended to be done in addition to your other activism, not instead of it. But they're all very simple, and they don't work if one or two people do them. They work if everybody does them. And here are the five things. You can read them on your um, cards as well. Uh, first of all, to learn about the situation in Palestine, which you're doing here tonight, and you should continue to do, and probably have in the past too. Sign up by visiting fiveforpalestine.org. Read about it. If you agree, sign up, please. Um, contact, your, contact your elected representatives five times a year. You can do this very easily through the website. Um, obviously, it's even better to go there in person. Um, but, but basically, to do it along with all of your other, all of the other people in your constituency, um, so that you're actually affecting, even with your letter writing, you're coming from one voice as opposed to fragments. Um, contribute $5 a month to the campaign. This is not a lot of money. This is less than a sandwich cost these days. Um, it's uh, basically if you have a couple hundred people in one area, in one constituency, um, giving $5 a month, you're, fine, you're actually able to open up a local office, have a local staff person, and build on that eventually state, state you know, lobby representatives basically um, going to Washington to actually lobby on your behalf. This is how other grassroots lobby organizations have been very effective. We can absolutely be as effective if we all do one thing in common. And I think this could work. Uh, the last thing is to get five family members, friends, or colleagues to join too. In a group like this, I'm sure you know five people who are also are sympathetic. Um, if you're young and have you know, are super or not young and have super are super into Facebook. Put it on your Facebook. You'll get people that way. Pretty easy. Um, it's actually a model built on that also that Obama has used to to mobilize people. Uh, basically, getting uh, a, a almost a consensus in the U.S. to actually function in an empowering and collective way. Um, Anyway, so there's one. So contacting elected um, officials, going to Palestine, educating ourselves and others. Other ideas? I just have a question of what TV stations have invited you to speak. Um, I'll answer that, but I just want to remind people this is not the Q&A part. We'll do that at the end. Oh, I'm um, sorry. But th that's okay. But yes, there have been, um, I mean, public access stations frequently invite me. Um, and as well, I've been invited by, uh, by local mainstream Stations, so Fox, ABC, NBC, if, if I'm in a particular city, let's say, so Fox in Rhode Island, I got to do an interview with them, that kind of It started in the streets, it started in the streets, not in institutions, not in institutions to write a constitution, who wrote any constitution that stagnated waves of revolution and complete eternal change. Who wrote this constitution? And do we know the meaning of the constitution, my brother? What does the constitution constitute to you, to me? Black man was it written for them or the brother who was made to rule the other? It started in the streets. It started in the streets, not in institutions, not in institutions, not in hospitals, bug houses, and beat up squads, where heavy shadows of death hang over a prison yard. Out of car, out of car, yes, I took her. My black queen from the stereotype of the educational system that impounded foul perversions of Western civilization or her beautiful black mind.